Yeah, morning, everybody. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, my name is Matt Fry from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hologeology. I'm hosting this, which is the sixth um, webinar in this AI for Environmental Science series, which is supported by NERC and the Constructing a Digital Environment Programme. Um, so this is a, a NERC programme that's been running since 2019 with the aim of envisaging and developing approaches to creating the future digital environment, exploiting advancing technology and increasingly diverse data sets to improve our understanding and management of the environment. Um, it's just had a very successful uh, conference this week. I hope some of you were able to make it, um, the NERC Digital Gathering 2023, and I believe um, some of the outputs and the, the uh, talks will be uh, loaded up onto YouTube in the coming weeks. Um, so yeah, we've had part of the this programme has been some funded projects, range of other activities, including the conference, um, but we've also had these webinar series, um, which are have covered a diverse kind of range of areas about um, the digital environment. Um, and this is a seventh, seventh series in uh, of webinars that the programmes run. Um, with, and it has a kind of format, we invite a presentation from a leading expert in the field, and then we have a chance for Q&A at the end of it. Um, you can see that all the other fantastic um, talks online in the YouTube channel, I think I'm going to post the link to the YouTube channel, so please go and subscribe to that. Um, and look into the videos we've had, the seminars we've had in the past. Yeah, so like I said, this is the seventh uh, webinar series and it's focusing on AI and environmental science. So focusing on the development, use and application of artificial intelligence uh, techniques in environmental science. So AI tools are enabling new analytical value to be delivered from existing sources of data as well as providing powerful tools for gathering new data. Um, and the webinar series has covered um, activities across lots of different areas. Um, I'm very excited to say that today's presentation is a seminar from Professor Ian Stiles of Queen's University Belfast and the Alan Turing Institute, um, and he's going to be talking about AI for biological imaging and sensing. Um, and it's quite a timely talk, as there's been a call out this week um, from NERC on, um, I'll get the title of it up, um, Tools for Automating Image Analysis for Biodiversity Monitoring, um, so relevant to a couple of the talks we've had in the series so far. Uh, and we'll post the link to that, so please do have a look at that. Um, but yeah, as I said, today's um, webinar is from Professor Ian Stiles. Um, Ian's Professor of uh, Computer Science at Queen's University Belfast, and he's previously at the University of Birmingham, where he's founding director of the Institute for Inter Interdisciplinary Data Science and AI, and the Turing University lead and PI and director of the e EPSRC funded Baskerville Tier 2 High Performance Computing Facility. So his principal research interest is imaging and image analysis with a particular focus on applications in biology and medicine. And he works across a wide range of imaging modalities to develop new techniques for understanding, extracting and summarizing the content, um, content rich high dimensional image data. Um, so the, the, we'll, um, Ian's gonna do a talk. Please post um, questions in the Q&A section rather than the chat and we'll field these all at the end and have a, have a chance to ask um, Ian some questions. So. Just check we've got the recording running. So um, I'll hand over to you, Ian. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. And uh, thank you very much to, to everyone for, for inviting me to, to be part of this, this seminar series. It's a pleasure to be speaking um, to, a, to a different audience to the one that I usually talk to. Um, so as, as Matt said in, in his introduction, my, my interests are in um, imaging, particularly in in, in biology and medicine. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some techniques we've been developing in, in, in that context. Uh, but I also want to make a nod towards how I think those techniques might be uh, might be relevant to, to, to the environmental sciences. And there's one very explicit example that I'll give where where I can where these techniques have already been applied in, in, in that domain. And then I can, I'll, I'll speculate a little bit on where uh, on, on how the other technique I'll talk about uh, might might be might be useful. Um, so let me just get the light focus. So a, a number of acknowledgements to, to to various people who've contributed uh, to this work. Um, of course, there's a large number of PhD students and postdocs in here uh, who, of course, do do the actual work uh, on, on these projects. I'll, I'll highlight particularly. Um, Jeremy Pike, um, who will who who did most of the work on the first project I'll talk about, 
uh, and Sam Tonks, who did uh, done the bulk of the work on the on the second project, I'll, I'll talk about. And uh, um, of course, uh, plays should go to them, and criticism should should come to me. Um, Matt already talked briefly about my 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 bio, and I won't elaborate too more, except just to reiterate, I, I recently joined Queen's University Belfast from uh, the University of Birmingham. Uh, and uh, so, so if any of you have have, have come across me before, then um, uh, that 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 move is that's a fairly recent recent move for me. Uh, I'm currently enjoying the, um, the 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 slightly different environment of Northern Ireland as compared to the West Midlands. Um, and if any of you are doing weather research, uh, then I can I can say with some certainty that we get all sorts of weather up here in, in Northern Ireland, uh, all on the same day and often within the same hour. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting new place to be. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, I, as I said, I've done most of my work in, in the biological and medical sciences, but there's an awful lot in common between those, those areas and, and the environmental sciences. Some of the techniques that are used uh, are very similar. Um, and if the techniques are similar, then quite often the, the data analytics will be, will be similar too. Uh, and imaging is a, is a really is important tool in the, in the biological sciences. Uh, it, it's, it, it's really fundamental and, and, and image, uh, biological labs uh, expend a great deal of both, both resources and effort in improving and advancing their imaging technologies. And the same, of course, is true in the environmental sciences. And so what I've tried to do in this, in this talk is, is to pick up two examples of, of, of areas where I think there is the, the significant potential um, for translation of these techniques into the uh, into the environmental sciences. Now, I'm not an, an expert in the environmental sciences, and I'm not completely up on the on the literature in the area. And so, it's quite possible that that there will be some things in comp things that, that I talk about today that are already being done. Uh, and in fact, I will give one example of of, of that. Uh, but there are some things that we've done in in the in the bio in the biological domain that I think might might be. Uh, of of interest to to, to some of you. So um, as I said, I've worked on a on a whole host of of problems in imaging in in, in the biosciences, ranging all the way down from um, things happening at very um, very small scales um, over over long time periods. So looking at at the, the the sort of long time evolution of of, of molecules within cells. Um, all the way up to, to to some to you know all the way up to, to looking at distributions of proteins in 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 whole organisms uh, and a whole range of stuff in between. Okay, um, some of which is is more or less relevant to, to the types of problems that you're interested in. I'm going to focus on on two of these areas. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about. Um, some techniques we developed for an imaging technique called single molecule localization microscopy. And that's a technique that I've, that's the problem that I've chosen because that work was directly inspired by a piece of work that was actually done in, um, on, on, on topical cyclone prediction. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll hint at, at, at that in, at, in, in, a, in, a, in a moment. The second piece of work I'm going to talk about is um, really to do with multi, it, I, I, it's called high throughput screening, that's what it says on the slide here, but really it's about multimodal data and about what predictions you can make across data modalities. So given, given uh, a whole bunch of multimodal data, can you make predictions of one data type from the other data types? And how do you ensure that you, that how do you validate whether your predictions are correct or not. So we do this in the bio domain. Um, I, th I think there's plenty of scope for doing this in the in the remote sensing um, domain uh, as as well. And I'll 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 say a few words about that towards the end. 
But I'm going to start by talking about um, a, a, a problem that's right down at the molecular scale, um, which is to do with identifying the locations of um, proteins in, in, in cells. So just despite its appearances, this is not, um, not, not a cosmological image of, of, of a galaxy. This is an image of, of proteins uh, in, uh, on the surface of a cell. Okay, um, it, it, it's what the protein is, and particularly matter. And there's, you know, there's some information on the bottom right about about what the cell type is. Um, briefly, the way this image is acquired is we take the protein we're interested in, which in this case is something called alpha tubulin, and we 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 attach a fluorescent marker to it, and we fiddle with the chemistry to make that fluorescent marker flash. So it flashes uh, stochastically. Uh, and you obtain an, a movie image that looks something like this. So you see lots of flashing points. And as we look at this image, we can see, we can perhaps, if you, if you look at it for long enough, um, you can see perhaps there's some evidence of some, some structures that look like they might be fibers in this, uh, and that perhaps there's a, there's a gap in the middle of, of that structure. Um, and, and indeed, there are indeed structures that look like fibers in this, and there is a gap, uh, a, a bit of a gap at least in, in, in the middle. And so this image that we, sh that we show here is a reconstruction from those, those flashing fluorophores um, that, that we then manage to localize. We, 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 we take each time step. We identify where the where the flashes are occurring, and then we accumulate those over time. The reason we do it in that way is because the resolution of the microscope is far far bigger than the size of the proteins. So what we do is we make them flash so they're only activated sparsely, and then if they're sparse, we can assume that they don't overlap, and therefore we can isolate them more effectively and more accurately. So. So this type of technique gives you um, very high resolution images um, of, of the structure of the protein that you're interested in. And that protein in this case is associated with a structure called the, the microtubule network. And that's what you see uh, in, in the image on the left and in, in slightly close up uh, on, in the image on the right. Now, Fundamentally, the data that we have here is comprised not of uh, not not of these these lines. Okay, okay. This is not a, this is not a direct image of these tubule of these microtubules. This is an image built up from 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 a set of points. And fundamentally, what we have is the coordinates of all of those um, uh, all of those flashing fluorophores. Okay, so and 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 this image is is a, is a is a computational reconstruction of that, but that masks a lot of what's going on here. And, and in fact, what we would like to be able to do is to rather than in inbuild a load of biases by reconstructing the image in this way, is to analyze those points, that point-like data, those sets of coordinates much more directly and to understand what that's telling us about the, the, the structures that we have. Okay. So the, the work I'm about to present is, is inspired directly by a paper that was, was, a, it, it, was it was actually published in 2020, but was released as a preprint a few years before this, um, that uses a technique called persistent homology to quantify um, something called a, a diurnal cycle that you get in, in, in tropical cyclone data. Um, so there's some kind of cyclical behavior in the data um, that, 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 that tells you that, that, that something repeats over about a 24 hour uh, time period. Now, cyclones are, are sort of interesting um, for, for this because um, they, they comprise a sort of circulating region with, with, with a hole in the middle. Um, and, and this comply, this was rather similar to something that we were, in, a problem that we were interested in in, in biology. 
Um, and so I, when I saw this paper, I, I, I thought that maybe there's something we can we can draw draw from this uh, and, and 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 apply in a slightly different area. Uh, and that technique is is persistent homology. Now, persistent homology is is a technique that is that draws heavily on a mathematical field called topology. Um, Topology is related to geometry, um, but whereas geometry is concerned with things like distances and areas and angles, topology is much more explicitly concerned with, with shape. And in particular about classes of shapes that can be deformed continuously from one shape to another. So I've, I've seen, uh, and, and humans are really good at this, okay? so. The, the three images at the bottom here are of images of a, of a structure called a vinculin ring that is, is quite common in, in biology. Um, and we can look at these three images and we can see that they contain a very distinct loop-like structure. There's a, there's a closed loop in each of these three images, um, but the closed loops are of very different shapes and of very different dimensions. Um, but but we can see them, we're, we're very good at doing this. Computationally, detecting those links, those, 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 clo those closed loops, given that, particularly given that they're not actually closed loops, because they, you know, they've clearly got gaps in them. And they're, remember, they're made up of point-like data. So all we've got is sets of coordinates here. So what, what these structures have in common, of course, is that you can you can deform one to the other in a in a fairly sort of continuous way, and this is what topology is good at. This is why it was used in that in that in that cyclone tropical cyclone application, um, is because there are the, the fundamental problem here is detecting structures that that are geometrically quite different, but are topologically very similar. And the sort of classical cartoon example that people use here is, is and at sort of 11 o'clock in the morning when it's everybody's coffee time is probably quite a good one, is that in geometrically, a coffee mug and a donut are, are very, very different. You wouldn't normally consider these to be the same shape. But topologically, they are, because you can take a coffee mug, and as is shown in the bottom right-hand corner here, you can deform it continuously without tearing any new holes or filling any holes in into a donut. You can imagine that if you had a piece of clay that you're going to make your mug out of, you could, you, you could, you maybe you've started to to form your, you, you formed your handle and your your the, the 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 bowl of your mug. You could take that piece of clay and you could continuously. Uh, remold it until it looks like the donut at the bottom. So this this approach, this this idea, this this very really sort of simple idea of of being able to continuously deform one shape into another, makes this problem of identifying a diverse range of shapes that are fundamentally the same quite much more tractable and it, it in fact provides a very robust and very flexible and extendable framework for it and this technique called persistent homology allows us to go from things that we know and, uh, and are familiar with geometry and to extract those those key topological um, uh, properties of, of, of these structures from that just to give you a sort of cartoon mathematical sketch of how you do this you take your set of data points which are the black dots on here and you draw areas around them so little circles around them and you grow those circles um, you, you 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 look at what happens to your and, and what if those circles intersect you draw the line between them and um you look at what happens to that that graph that network as you increase as you vary the size of the circles and what you'll find is that things that are what we would call real features like holes in the middle of those loops will persist over a large range of 
length scales, by which I mean the diameter of these circles. To show you what I mean, let's run a cartoon example. Okay, so we have some points and we have a small circle drawn around them. Okay, and each of the lines on this bar, on this thing at the bottom here called a barcode represents one of those points. Okay, as we increase the size of that radius of that circle, we get to a certain point here where two of the two of the points have this, their circles have joined and we draw a line between them. And that uh, those two circles are replaced by a single component corresponding to that joined pair. Uh, and, and that happens at a radius of about seven units. OK, and so one of those components gets deleted at about seven units. We continue doing this and we, we join a few more things up and we find that they get replaced in this barcode by the uh, by a single component that represents those four things joined together. So far, we're not learning very much. But we get to a, a point here whereby we have joined all of these points together and we now have a, 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 a very small void, very small region that, that, is, that is closed, okay? So there is a closed loop in the structure here uh, and that tells us potentially something important about the cyclical nature of our data. Um, we also, rather than just joining pairs of points together, we join uh, triplets of points together and it is soon and we'll well, I'm not going to show this explicitly because I can't in 2D we'll join tetrahedra together so triplet quadruplets of points we continue doing this and we form another hole like big hole like structure here and finally everything gets closed off okay now the important thing about this is that the process of forming this this network-like structure makes the process of detecting these void regions, these holes, very, very easy indeed. There's some simple algebra, linear algebra that one can do to, to isolate this. Okay. <laughs> uh, and you can you can you can picture this, you can you can do this graphically if you want. This is a perhaps a much better illustration of, of how it works. Um, and, and you can see that you've got this very robust hole-like structure on the right-hand side here that, that persists for a very long, very long time as you're forming this network. Okay, so this is this this is what the technique um, that that can be formalized very extremely rigorously mathematically that you can use to, to detect that type of of structure in your data. Now, in 2D, it seems like a bit of, a bit of overkill, but in fact, this problem is really computationally difficult in 2D. And in higher dimensions, it, it, it's even harder. Um, and in, in the higher dimensions, things become really problematic because we then can't visualize this. To, it, to do this by eye is really easy. In 2D, in, in higher dimensions, it can become virtually impossible um, 3D is just about possible. Um, in 3D, of course, you don't just have have holes in a donut. You have might have say um, void regions inside a football, um, where there's where all of the points might lie on the outside of the football. All your data points might lie on the outside of the football, and the inside is empty. Okay, very difficult to to to, to see sometimes, uh, and in again in higher dimensions almost impossible okay this technique is is dimension independent and can scale up to any number of dimensions that you want uh, the algebra is is completely general uh, and independent of dimensionality so uh, and here's just another video showing this on a slightly more random collection of points and again you can see this this whole preserving uh, structure in the, in the, in the bottom in, on the bottom there. So how did we? What did we do with this? <clears throat> so we applied this to a problem of understanding uh, the distributions of molecules on 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 cellular structures. We first 
used it um, as a, uh, a very robust clustering technique. So you can take you can take the technique and adapt it a little bit to identify what we would to to do clustering using a, a concept that that we call persistence. Okay, which looks at basically at density of points relative to their local neighborhood and identifies whether a point is is um, is uh, wh whether a, a, a an increase in density is truly robust against its background. Um, an example that, that I've heard used on this, which I think is probably reasonably uh, accurate, is is looking at you know mountains on molehills. Okay. The, the, the molehill on a mountain, you might have a small molehill on the side of a mountain that represents a, a, a region of increased uh, density, but compared to the global landscape of the mountains, um, it, 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 it's irrelevant, okay? So the, the, this notion of persistence looks at how robust something is above its, above its local background level. And in, a, in an area where you have very, very noisy data, that allows you to do very robust clustering, okay? So we're, the, um, the particular biological question we're looking at here is one of uh, inhibiting a biological process um, with a, um, so, so it's, a, it's a particular receptacle, the site receptor, uh, that can be inhibited by a drug uh, and that has an effect on uh, accumulation of other things, in particular, um, the clustering of a protein called integrin. Uh, and we were able to show extremely robustly using this, this idea of persistence-based clustering uh, that uh, the application of a drug uh, that inhibits that site receptor um, reduces the mean area of, of, of those clusters. We could not do this using any of the other established clustering techniques like k-means or db scan or other or any of the other clustering techniques. They all fail on this problem um, because the nature of the clustering is 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 very subtle. But this technique is able to pick it up extremely robustly, uh, and we have uh, we have biological we have a, a different. Um, uh, approach to this that, that is able to verify this using a different different measurement technique. Uh, and so we use that as, a, as an external validator of, of, of this approach. That notion of external validation is something I will come back to very shortly in the, in the next section. We were also able to use this to, um, to detect um, something more subtle about the organization of cell surface receptors. Um, which is um, whether they organize themselves um, in, a, in a kind of uniform, uh, dense cluster, or if there is structure within those clusters. And it won't surprise you um, from what I said earlier, uh, that, that we're quite interested in whether there are whole-like regions in the organizations of the protein. So you can see, if you look at these images at the top, this is a, these are images of something called a nucleopore complex. They all form quite distinct ring-like structures, and that's a very well-known um, uh, phenomenon, okay? And you can see it in the images. But doing large-scale quantification of this, um, is is extremely difficult because it's it, it, the, the, again the data is we can do it quite nicely by eye. Um, we can, but 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 doing it computationally has proven to be uh, an extraordinarily difficult thing to do because the variation in in the clusters and the amount of added noise in the images is, is really very difficult. Uh, and so we were able to do that. The, the nuclear pore structure, by the way, is is a hole into the the nuclear the, the, into the nucleus of the of, of the cell, um, and it's a way that that things get in and out of the of of of, of, of the cells. Uh, so we were able to 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 to, to classify to to identify and isolate those structures uh, and and indeed count them 
um, ex and, and, and profile them extremely robustly with this approach. Uh, and, and on the right hand side here, we show a, a different biological problem um, where we have similar phenomena. We have uh, structures that have uh, that have holes in that co-localize with other structures that don't. And so uh, this, this approach has proven to be very robust and very scalable for looking at large scale screens of these. Um, I'm fairly sure that there are, bio, there are problems in environmental science where you may be able to, to draw on similar uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, on this type of technique. Um, in 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 that in that different context, but in 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 this in this problem, this is proven to be extremely robust and very scalable. Uh, and so we were we and and and, and th th this this work it turns out is now become a quite a quite a popular uh, technique that's been drawn on by the rest of the the imaging community working in this area. <laughs> so. I'm going to move on now to the second topic I said I'd talk about, which is a very recent piece of work. Uh, it's been done in collaboration with uh, the pharmaceutical company GlaxoSmithKline um, and, and my colleague, uh, so PhD student Sam Tonks uh, and my colleague Alex, my former colleague Alex Clullen, continuing collaborator who's, who's still at the University of Birmingham. The problem we were interested in here is, is one of something called high throughput screening, which is ubiquitous in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and it's, 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 it's used in the very early stages of drug development to screen large numbers of drug candidates uh, on, on, single, on, on cell cultures um, to, uh, to, to see if they can identify uh, a, a biological effect um, it, of, a, of a drug on, on a particular cell type. Um, and it, it's, it's perhaps one of the very earliest stages in the drug development cycle. So what it, the way roughly it works is they take a, a candidate drug compound and they dose up a they, they, they dose up a cell culture with that drug compound. And they look to see what it does. Uh, and the way they look to see what it does is they image it down a microscope. And in order to see the things that they that they that they're interested in, they apply a they 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 add a a, a fluorescent label um, to to the structures that they think uh, the drug is going to affect. Uh, and so what you end up with is images of, of a number of fluorescent labels attached to a, a range of different structures, um, and they look to see what effect the drugs have on those structures. So um, in, this, in this study, what we have is we have um, a fluorescent label that's bound to, to the cytoplasm, which is the fluid inside the, that makes up the bulk of the interior of biological cell. Um, we have something that's bound to uh, a, a drug that's bound to the a, a fluorophore that's bound to the structures within the nucleus of the cell, and we have a drug that it's, we have a fluorophore that specifically looks for damage to to DNA, so identifies damage to to, to the structure of DNA uh, and and attaches itself to that. So with those fluorophores, we can image those three structures um, separately. We can also take what's called a bright field microscopy image, which is where we basically shine light through the sample um, and, um, and, and, and it gets attenuated by different structures uh, in the image um, and gives us some very gross level information about what's present in the image. But at least on first sight, doesn't give us any of the specific detail that these images contain. This is extremely costly. They do this um, millions of times um, across millions of plates, uh, of, of sample plates. It's very time consuming um, and it's limited by a phenomenon called spectrum saturation, which dictates basically what fluorophores you can use here 
and still image them uniquely. And so the question that we, we asked here is, can we take a very simple image type, uh, like the bright field image that we see on the right? So this is a very low contrast, low co and, and at least superficially low content image. And can we somehow, is, is there, is there hidden or correlated information within this image that we can't see with the human eye? And can we somehow extract the, um, the, the information that, that, is, that is correlated to these fluorescent images from that low contrast image? Now, this might seem like a, an, an impossible task, okay? This image is really very poor, but it doesn't, doesn't show you very much at all. Uh, these images show you quite a lot of detail. But it turns out, as we will show in a moment, um, there is a lot more, image, lot more information contained in that bright field image than we can see with the naked eye, okay? And, It turns out that this prediction problem of going from that bright field image to these images is in a sense possible, okay? And I say in a sense, because there are some caveats to this um, that, that I'll touch on at the end here. Now, one can immediately see that one might have applications of this in, in say, remote sensing. So particularly if you have, um, if you're looking at sort of very high high spectral resolution multispectral data, you might ask the question: Do we do we need to acquire all of that data? Can we predict some of it from other um, other modalities? Can we can we reduce the spectral resolution of that data? Um, is, is another thing you might want to do just to a you know perhaps increase the the, the time resolution or just reduce the, the, the amount of data that you acquire, okay? Um, so the, the, the technique, the, the way we've approached this is, is to, to take a, a, a technique that's been quite popular for a while in, in computer vision, which is that of image to image translation. And people have, have been playing with this um, for, a, for a number of years now. Um, and it's allowed the computer vision people to do things like um, um, convert between images of zebras and horses, um, to, 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 to take a photograph and to generate a painting in the style of Monet, um, or to recolorize an image to take a summer scene and convert it into a winter scene. Okay. Now, this is all this is, and, and you, if, if any of you have played with tools like Dali or Mid Journey um, or, or indeed Stable Diffusion, which are some of the, the more the more popular tools at the moment, um, doing this type of thing is 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 really really popular uh, and can generate some some really uh, really impressive images with the, with the techniques that people use use nowadays. Now, of course, it's one thing to generate a pretty picture, and it's another thing for those pictures to be genuinely accurate. Um, and if you start looking at the, at the details of some of these, you can look at, for example, this picture of a, of a zebra down here, and you can see it just doesn't quite look like right. there's something not right about the, the striping pattern around the, around the face. Um, and and you know it's it's kept kept the horse's mane, which which zebras that don't really have in so much so much, uh, and and that might not matter for a kind of toy application like that, but for biological data and indeed for environmental sensing data, it it really does matter because you want to do science with the with with the synthetic images that you would generate here. So we. The, the, you know, the pharmaceutical industry have been very excited about the potential of this type of technology for replacing multiplex imaging. Uh, and so what we set out to do was to try to understand whether we could do that image to image translation task of predicting fluorescent images from bright field accurately and reliably enough to do biology with those synthetic images. 
Okay, so we used a we used an off the shelf uh, image to image translation uh, system. It's a it's a it's based on a a, a, a pair of uh, general. It's based on a pair of generative adversarial networks. Um, we might do it differently if, now, and I'll hint, maybe hint at that how we might do it differently at the end. Um, but basically, it's trained. It, it's trained on paired data. So we we train on um, we we have a, a large data set of 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 image of paired image data where we have bright field images and um, the the corresponding uh, images of our three fluorescent stains, and we train a, a neural network, a generative adversarial network, to to predict uh, to to generate the fluorescent images conditioned on that bright field image okay so we have the we have the benefit here of having a very large um, supervised training set so a very we have 1.5 million images we didn't use all of them we used about 300,000 of them uh, because we found we were getting diminishing returns uh, on 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 that we had that the 300,000 was more than enough um, to, 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 to do what we wanted. Okay, so we, we, we having slowing down neural network to do this, we were able to generate arbitrarily large numbers of synthetic uh, images. And so what we have uh, on the, the two rows here, um, the top are the ground truth images, uh, and the bottom are synthetic images generated from the corresponding the the bright field image corresponding to the top row and you can look at these and visually they they certainly look plausible and if we didn't have the ground truth image we would perceive each of these synthetic images to be um to be very believable uh as in they were they were good enough to fall um, expert biologists who were unable to detect them in a uh, in a blind test. So we 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 put a panel of these to a to a to some experts and asked them to to say whether they could could detect which one was real and which one was synthetic, uh, and they were not they were not able to do so uh, reliably at all. Okay, so and, and we we were able to 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 to. Um, so that 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 you know that's one test, okay. Um, and the other tests that we that we ran on this included um, it were, were, to, were to use a number of uh, what we would call internal validation measures, um, including structural similarity index, peak signal to, and peak signal to noise ratio, to assess the the faithfulness uh, and the and the, the quality. Of the the generated images, so the structural similarity index compares an image to its ground truth, and the peak signal to noise ratio looks at the, the sort of overall quality of, of the image. And in 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 all cases, those internal validation measures that look solely at the images um, indicated that the synthetic images were very good indeed. Um, which was encouraging, um, but we were still not quite confident about this. And the reason was that even though these these statistical measures um, were able to were, 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 did not generate any significant differences between the real and synthetic images, and even though the biologists couldn't tell them couldn't tell them apart when they didn't know, when you actually look at them. There are some there are some subtle differences in them that we we thought could be biologically important. So if you look, for example, uh, at the region indicated by the arrow here, you'll notice that in 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 the in the ground truth, there's the, this this cell towards the upper region of of this of the cytoplasm image shows a quite different dis distribution um, of the fluorophore compared to the synthetic image. And if you look at, again on the right hand side um, at the DNA damage channel and, and the cell that's highlighted with the arrow, you can see very different distribution of, of, of the dye, of the fluorescent dye 
in, in that cell. So we we thought that there was something that although these were visually plausible and statistically plausible, that they that they may not be biologically as 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 realistic as we might have hoped. Um, and we began to put a little bit of flesh on this by trying to understand whether the image to image translation technique itself believes its own predictions. So we decided to look at the variability of the output um, of, of the network, which does have a stochastic component to it. Um, and we generated large numbers of synthetic images and looked at the variation across them. So look, computed the variance of the predictions basically on a pixel by pixel basis. Um, and we found that although they are biologically, they're, they're visually plausible and statistically plausible, some image channels in particular, noting particularly the, 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 the channel that has uh, for, for, for DNA damage, has quite significant variability in its predictions. Okay, in other words, there are many plausible biological images, there are many, many visually plausible images that that network could generate that have excellent statistical properties and excellent visual, uh, and look, look excellent visually, but actually they're, they're highly variable. Um, and that gives us, that caused us, um, uh, again, a little bit more suspicion about whether these things are, are, are biologically useful. To, to, to really flesh out what was going on here, we, uh, we took a, the standard image analysis pipeline that um, GSK use in assessing um, their, their images. Uh, and what this pipeline does is it uses classical image analysis, image processing techniques to compute a number of, of scores um, that, that, that represent things that they think they're interested in. So some of them do things like count the number of nuclei. Um, some of them compute statistical properties like the, 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 the intensity mean. Some of them compute much more sophisticated measures of texture uh, on the images. And um, in, in many cases, the, the networks are able to um, so in, in, in particular, in the, in the, in the nuclear, the images of nuclei, the, uh, most of the statistical measures, most of the, 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 the feature, image features um, in the synthetic images are indistinguishable from, the, from the, the same features calculated on the ground fluid images. So that's good, okay? But there are one or two things that are not the same, that, that vary. Okay, the well, one or two features that, that really do vary significantly. And when we consider um, different channels, when we start considering the DNA damage channel, the amount of variability between the, um, be, be, between the, 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 the features calculated on the ground truth and calculated on the, um, on the synthetic images, they begin to become really quite wildly different. Okay, even though they're visually plausible. Okay. <laughs> so, so we 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 concluded from this that that although perhaps some of the images, particularly the the, the, nucle the images of the nucleus, and to perhaps a lesser extent the images of the cy cytoplasm, are are pretty good and are at least moderately reliable, the image of the DNA damage channel. Is, is far less reliable, even though it's visually and statistically plausible. Okay. We, we took this a step further and we looked at a, 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 it, at a, at a measure of whether um, the synthetic images were able to show uh, a drug effect. Okay. So we took images of the of experimental control samples that didn't have a drug applied to them. And we compared them using something called an RZ score, 
um, with images that had had a drug control applied, a drug applied to them. And we looked for, for differences uh, between those images. And higher, higher values of, of the RZ score indicate the consistent difference between, between the images. So we took some of the image, some of the image features with the with the highest scores, i.e., the most significant features, and we we computed the uh, the RZ score to assess whether the, the synthetic images were able to show a consistent difference between um, the similarities, the 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 ground truth and the experimental controls. Okay, so what we see here is this, this top line here, this, so just this line, um, sorry, let me just remind myself of what's what here. So the images show that given the ground truth image, um, you are able to consistently, all of, all of the uh, image features uh, to greater or lesser degrees indicate that there is a drug effect. They all have quite large values. Okay. When we consider the virtual nuclei images, they're slightly less effective at identifying the drug effect than the ground truth images, but they're still potentially plausible. The virtual nuclei and the cytoplasm images taken together are also able to, to reflect um, uh, that the, the, the drug has an effect. But when we introduce the DNA damage channel, any notion that there is an effect of the drug, any different, consistent difference between the experimental control and the drug dose sample disappears, according to, 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 to this measure. And so uh, the, the, the effect, ultimate effect of this is, is that, that the the poor biological quality of that DNA, synthetic DNA damage image has destroyed any of our ability to detect a drug effect in, in those synthetic images. So what's our conclusion from this? These image to image translation methods can produce visually and statistically realistic virtual, virtual screening uh, images. Um, but what we've demonstrated here is that visual realism and, and indeed statistical realism is not the same as biological relevance. And if you were to rely on, on those synthetic images alone, any downstream analysis you may you do, such as determining whether there's a drug effect or not, may well fail if you haven't done sufficient validation on your, on your data. So if you're thinking of doing this in remote sensing, um, my strong advice is do not rely on visual realism or statistical um, measures of, 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 of image quality, um, because those types of internal validation are, are not sufficient to, uh, to, to distinguish whether you're the, con the, 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 the important content of your synthetic images is actually present. And you need to think about whether there is an independent external validation that you can use. Uh, in our case, we had those, those, those features generated from, a, from an independent pipeline that we could use to assess um, the, 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 the true quality of the, and the, the, the true content of the image data. So although we think that, that there is um, significant scope for these methods, um, the, uh, th there is still a lot of work to be done on, on genuinely um, evaluating them properly. Now, one question that you might ask of this is perhaps this is an artifact of the, um, of the, the technique we use to translate between the images. So we've got some, um, we've got some, we've, we've started doing some explorations as to whether some newer methods, in particular, the, in particular diffusion models, 
um, can do any better in, in this domain. Um, and they, they're able to generate some really impressive and really high quality images. Um, th this is, uh, the, the image in this case is um, images of, these are images of um, brain tissue. So these are the sorts of brain atlas type data that, that people use. So slices of brain tissue and looking at delineating nerve cells within that. Okay. Uh, and and it's able to do some 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 quite get some quite impressive results um, from from these diffusion models, which which do the predictions in a slightly different way. Um, but so far, they're failing um, for the the types of data that that we've been working with. And we need to do a, quite a bit more work on 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 understanding why that is. Uh, part of the problem is that this method is is much slower um, uh, than, than, the, than the, the, the GAN based method that we'd used previously. Um, but, but this is, this is an, an avenue that we're actively pursuing. So with, with that, um, I want to, to just wrap up the talk with a, with a brief summary of, 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 of what we've covered here. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is two techniques that I think could have some um, some application in, uh, in, in environmental science um, and particularly environmental imaging. Um, the first technique uh, we, we showed was looking at identifying structure and in particular void, void regions in, in point-like spatial measurements. Um, we did this at the, in term, for, for the distribution of, of molecules within, within a cell. Um, but you could equally, I, I, I guess that that you know you could look at you know, something that comes to mind is schools of fish and and, and that sort of thing uh, in in the environmental sciences. But I'm sure there are many more applications of this, uh, and indeed there's at least one known application in 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 weather slope climate in 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 tropical cyclone. Uh, uh, in in, in uh, understanding top, the behavior of a, of a tropical cyclone. The second thing we talked about is something that is, is this multimodal data translation problem that I think could have some very nice applications in remote sensing. Um, but as we we found in the biological case, needs to be done very, very carefully. So it's very easy to get excited about very realistic images. Um, but you do need to think very hard about whether you uh, whether those are genuinely trustworthy. Um, and whether they do contain the, con e even if all of the statistics and all of the visual analysis you do of them looks convincing, um, I, I, you, uh, I, uh, an independent external validation is essential. But I do have some confidence um, that that we are that when we can get those types of pipelines in place, uh, and given particularly some very recent advances we've seen. Um, in, in AI, and there's some really exciting techniques um, coming out at, at all, all the time at the moment. Um, I do think that within the next few years that, that we'll be able to do some really quite exciting things with these techniques. Uh, I'd just like to, to sum up by saying that there are, um, I, I, you know, there are many more problems um, in, in, in the biosciences that, 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 I could, that I could talk about um, that have a lot in common um, with techniques in, in, in the environmental sciences. So some of the multispectral work we do in the biosciences compared to, to some of the multispectral remote sensing work. Um, and I think that, that there's a lot of scope for the two communities talking um, much more frequently than they perhaps do. Um, I have almost outstayed my, my welcome, so I'm going to stop talking now, but I do have time for some questions if anybody would like to ask any, and I'll stop sharing. Thanks very much, Ian. That's fascinating. Thanks. It's really very interesting. Um, yeah, you haven't outstayed your welcome at all. I'm sure people would be happy to stay um, and ask some questions. So like I said, pe um, people post those in the Q&A. We can field them on to Ian. So that's great. I mean, I could already see loads of um, yeah, applications in environmental science. So those are really interesting to understand those methods. And even, you know, just a quick search while you're talking, thinking about LIDAR data where you get these point clouds um, and people are, looks like people are already using that persistent homology there, but I'm sure there's lots of interesting aspects. That's interesting that we're already doing it, yeah. 
well, very recently by the looks of it as well. Um, I, was, I was wondering, so you, you're talking about um, holes in, in those yeah. plates, but is, is, does it, you can it be used for other types, um, other kind of features and structures and things? So, so I think, so, it, so persistent homology is, is, is principally concerned with, with continuous deformation. So it, it's really, in, it, it, it really is best suited to identifying whether you've got regions of space that are not occupied or regions of your data space that are not occupied um, but by, by things. Now, in you would, as we did, and I didn't, didn't get into this particularly in, in, in what I talked about earlier, the, we, would, we combine this with geometric measures. So it, it, it's, it's very useful for sort of bulk level characterization of structures. But doesn't tell you it doesn't you know it doesn't tell you you know how how dense your points are how far apart they are or anything like that directly, but it does it does tell you whether the structure belongs to a class to a wider class of of other structures, uh, and and that can be really useful both for high throughput analysis um, or for very high dimensional data where you can't detect that type of information at all. Yeah, we had a, a good talk, uh, one of the keynote talks at the digital conference this week about um, yeah, using point cloud LIDAR data on trees and identifying individual tree structures and branch structures. So it's, there's obviously lots of applications there. So and that does relate to that, 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 that you, you can draw on this to, to do some analysis on those types of structures, yes. I have seen that done. Sounds good. So there's a, there's a question in the chat from Tom Wilding said, um, that's a very interesting talk, thanks. So for the drug testing example, when trained on 300,000 images, is it possible that the machine is better than the fluorescent dye because the machine will integrate over all images to predict where the fluorescence would have been located in a single image? So that's a really good question. Um, for this case, we don't think so, um, simply because the the quality of the the input images, the, the the bright field images, is is really very poor indeed, and and we don't think that there's any grounds to believe that the the machine would be doing much better here. Now, I do concede that if you had a much better quality um, source of, if you had a really high quality source of input data, and perhaps the the techniques that you were trying to predict were of low quality. Then you might get a, a, a very different answer, and you might want to put more faith on your prediction. Um, so, if, if the tables were turned and we had a, a, an extremely clear and high resolution bright field image and very poor quality fluorescence images, then I, I, that, that, that may well be true. That's interesting. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing as. An interesting you question about. that I hadn't thought about. Thank you for that. Uh, thinking the same thing as you mentioned about the potential applications to. Yeah, hyperspectral imagery from satellites or drones, which is increasingly happening, and whether you could, uh, yeah, people looking at trying to generate that type of data from cheaper cheaper methods if they've got enough I, data. I think, that, I think there's good cause to believe that you might be able to generate some of the spectral channels from other spectral channels, which might allow you to acquire in a much lower resolution. Yeah, or well, much much more cheaply. Um, yeah. so, so I have another question on that. Um, because obviously, you, potentially, you could have a model that could just generate likely-looking images that could fool a biologist from from nothing at all, without an initial bright field image. But so is, yeah, absolutely, yes. So, is, so is there anything in it's kind of is there a way of producing sort of measures of the intrinsic information in those initial images that relating to the actual final application of it? Is there are ways to sort of jump jump that step to see if an image is going to be any use or not? I don't know. Um, I don't think we've got. So one thing, one thing that we. So you always need to. So one one thing here is you always need to have a sort of biological grounding in this. Now, here we've always started with with an image, um, but actually, I think nowadays you could start with with other sources of data. So you could start with a bunch of experimental parameters. Uh, and generate synthetic images from those. So much as you see, you'll have seen the 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 the, the techniques that can generate uh, images from a, a, a piece of text. Um, so from a caption, 
Okay, you could envisage that you could enter a description of an experiment and get a bunch of images out. I have no idea how how accurate those would be. Um, I if I could envisage and and you know people are thinking about this and we're thinking about the equivalent of large language models for this type of problem. So how do we how do we train an enormous model? that could encapsulate everything we know about, about biological cells. Okay, that, That's looking slightly more feasible than it perhaps once was. And you know, you could be thinking about the same in terms of in terms of in, environmental images, I'm sure. And I'm sure people are thinking about this. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Thanks very much. Just just final one then. Just what could you kind of summarize what you said? You mentioned you've been working with kind of companies with those with those workflows. What's the kind of impact of those, the output of that method? Is it is it just about time saving and things, or is it? No, certainly that that the, they've become. I mean, I wouldn't like to say that we've we, you know we've dampened their enthusiasm, but I think we've shown them that that you know they we. People in uh, so I'm being trying to trying to not not be too critical here. People in people in um, high up in large organisations like that are always looking for ways of saving money, right? Um, and I, th I think that the, the, the work like this helps. It, it, it's that the, the, these techniques are promising, okay? But we can't get rid of our labs just yet. Um, but I, you know, I think I think you know, digital biology is, is in in that sense is coming, um, and and you know, the, 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 it, I'm pretty confident that it is going to happen to greater to a greater or lesser extent. Um, exactly how much it will replace wet lab work, uh, I think that's still to still to, to to be worked out. Great, well, that's. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Ian. I think that's probably all we've got time for today. Thanks, everyone, for, for staying on. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Ian, for your presentation and discussion. Just to remind everyone, we'll, we've recorded the session. We'll have that available on the, the website and on YouTube channel again soon. We could post the link to that. Um, just to say that, yeah, the next webinar is going to be on Friday, the 4th of August, again, at 11 o'clock with um, Tom Anderson of the British Antarctic Survey, um, talking about tackling diverse environmental prediction tasks with neural processes. Um, so please yeah, make note of that and book it in, find the link on the website and register for that one. And uh, yeah, again, thanks very much, Ian. And um, Thank um, you all for your attention and thanks for inviting me.